Without further ado, we will ease into the historical discussions with a paper on replica flying by Mr. Horst Phillips. Horst is a uh, former pilot of uh, the German Air Force. He worked as a test pilot at the Flight Test Center in Europe. He is a graduate of the French Test Pilot School and currently, though retired uh, from active flight test, he works for the Willy Messerschmitt Flying Museum at EADS Manching. And he's the project pilot and demo pilot for Jet Historical Air Force, for Jet Historical Aircraft, excuse me. Horst is a member of the society and he's going to speak to us this afternoon for a few minutes on the historical flying machine, Gustav Whitehead 21. How about a big SETP welcome for Mr. Horst Phillip. Ed, thank you for the warm welcome. Ladies and gentlemen, dear friends from the society, I feel honored to be here. My uh, presentation is uh, testing the uh, flying machine Gustav Whitehead number 21B. When talking about the centennial of powered flight, we are linked more or less to the names of the Wright brothers. Names of other early pioneers are not so well known, like Pilcher or Jato or even Gustav Whitehead, who may have flown as early as 1901. The name came back to light in 1934 when this newspaper report describing a powered flight was found. Yep, sir. <clears throat> At the Wright family, several original photos had survived too, exhibiting a seemingly fully developed flying machine identified as Whitehead, Whitehead number 21. In course of further research, about a dozen eyewitnesses stated of having observed Whitehead repeatedly conduct flights of mainly 300 feet in distance at an altitude of four to six feet. Unfortunately, there is no picture showing number 21 in flight up till today. The quality of the glass plate photographs and data gleaned from newspaper reports encouraged US aviation engineers to draw plans. Eventually, two full-scale flyable reproductions were built. 21A was built in the United States at Bridgeport, Connecticut, nearby where Whitehead had lived. 21B was built in Germany, Bavaria, where he was born. The later reproduction was handed over to me for flight testing, and that's why a German test pilot is giving a presentation about an aircraft which was developed in the United States. Though looking somewhat bizarre, it is basically a conventional design. An analyst may find more flight critical than flight promoting peculiarities. But nevertheless, when eyewitnesses were right, it had flown. And it seemingly, seemingly did so. This is number 21A, unfortunately lacking flight data recording, so the power required could not be determined. <clears throat> But the short hop showed that the machine has some potential for flight. For flight testing number 21B, we had two primary test objectives, power and stability. A flight test program was set up comprising of four test phases, TOCA tests, towed flights, powered flights, and number four, flight with a whitehead engine uh, we did, couldn't make it because the engine is not in the condition to be flown. The, phase, the test phase number one was started using a camper chassis serving as a poor man's wind tunnel. It was equipped with instrumented shackles, a flight data recorder, and a pitostatic probe 
Soon it became evident why movable wind tunnels enjoy limited popularity. But in spite of all the shortcomings, the tow card was decisive for conducting the program and for achieving adequate safety. <clears throat> the clip shows a typical test run with a tow card. Many experts, pre experts predicted that the wing cannot produce any lift. Only so much to the experts. <laughs> the backlight picture reveals why it can produce lift. The wing spars, which are on top, are embedded in the sail. The wing surface is rather smooth. However, the initial test results were disappointing. The speed for flight was way too high, unattainable with only 20 horsepower of the engine. The low performance was because of not rigging the wing cross-section correctly. Instead of being cambered, like the wing of the original aircraft uh, crash photo, the upper one, it was found being absolutely flat, as the lower photo shows. The wing profile was therefore cambered to the limit, to that point when the fabric of the wing began loose to lose the tension. Whitehead would, ha would not have uh, bent the spars any, any further. With this, I had the guarantee that both the or original and the reproduction number 21 had the same camber ratio and consequently the same aerodynamic performance. I guess we have one minute longer. I want to point out that the airplane, the original, had a tandem gear. Everybody knows the tandem gear cannot be rotated on takeoff. You have to fly it from the ground, and if you have only 20 horsepower, you are limited in speed. So it's very important that the geometric incidence is at the right point. If it is too flat, you won't get the speed to get the lift to get off the ground. If the angle is too, too uh, steep, you would have too much drag to attain the speed. So it had to be just right. And for my taste, this was the most crit critical design point of this airplane. And I will came, come later to, to what incident angle he had. He had nine degree, as you can see, nine degree in average. And let's put it this way, I found out that L versus D max was exactly nine degree. It couldn't be better. This was one of the puzzling things I found when I worked with this airplane. <clears throat> so, the overall gain was, the overall gain was, <laughs> From there, much like we did with the up and away maneuvers, we went and rank ordered our configurations in terms of what was our favorite to our least favorite. And if you look there, it almost looks like the previous chart. What we found was pitch augmentation was a necessity to do the operational task of level flight and landing. And as a matter of fact, those rankings are the exact same rankings that we had up and away. To try to put some numbers to our results, we, uh, we were obviously collecting a lot of Cooper Harper ratings for each of the configurations and each of the landing attempts. Uh, to familiarize you with uh, what we have set up here, along the bottom are the Cooper Harper ratings from 1 to 10. One's obviously very good, a 10 would be really bad. So let's take a look at our first result. On this one, we can see that everything is skewed over to the right, which is bad. This is uh, with no uh, pitch sass on, very difficult to control. Next, we see what happens. As soon as we turn the pitch sass on, everything starts shifting over to the left. We actually start getting some uh, level two handling qualities, far more manageable. Uh, all the pilots agreed on this. We turn, next, we turn on the roll sass, and here, one pilot actually liked the roll sass better, so we get one uh, even further over to the left. Uh, some of the results are, are not skewed, but you have to notice that uh, the results get better because uh, the pilots ended up on the first landing. This is the first time they'd land the Learjet after months of, uh, of not seeing the picture, so there was a little bit of a shift to the left just due to it not being their first, uh, first landing. 
And then with the warp rudder interconnect, we end up with even more problems. We end up with several tens. The reason here is the pilot is so busy trying to handle the lateral directional and the pitch that uh, it's kicking off into the, uh, the, the safety pilot's way too nervous and has taken over. One thing to note on here, uh, you typically don't see a 10. A 10 means that you have lost control, and it's only because we're in the in-flight simulator that we could actually lose control of the aircraft without crashing and could be here to talk about it. And that's what you see. These are all the boarded landings that we had. That's where we get the 19 successes out of uh, 23 attempts. We take the same look at the uh, pitch-induced oscillations, similar results. Once we turn the pitch SAS on, the pitch os uh, pilot-induced oscillations go away. The uh, pilot has enough, uh, is not chasing this 0.6 uh, to time to double amplitude uh, rate getting away from them. And uh, the, again, getting into the, uh, the configuration four, really bad results towards the right with the uh, WRIR. WRI off. We also wanted to take a look at, uh, that kind of was uh, opinionated, how about let's take a look at the workload. Here you're looking at the longitudinal deflection where the stick is residing most of the time and as you come in on approach you would like the stick just to be right there in a trim position making minor adjustments. That's pretty much what you see when the pitch sass is on. When we turn the pitch sass off it flattens out. We're hitting the extremes of the flight control of, uh, of the stick envelope there, trying to catch uh, the pitch oscillations prior to uh, disengaging our simulator. We take the same look at the lateral directional. And again, if you look at the bottom one there, it is completely spread out. Because every time you put in a control input, you're getting some adverse yaw, you're chasing it with rudder, now you forgot about your hand, and you're just chasing it back and forth. It's really spread out. This is a definite indication of how much workload is involved with that. This is a plot of the rudder pedal uh, displacement. And Sparky was able to come up with a slightly different technique. You see a lot of high frequency dithering in there. I'll let him talk a little bit more about what was happening during this, uh, this successful landing. The first time I took control of the aircraft up in the air, it was a, somewhat of a panic because the first three times that I took control, the system tripped itself off. And I thought to myself, great, we spent all this money on this program and we're not even going to be able to fly this thing. So I quickly had to use my two-bit brain and come up with a way to figure out how to keep the airplane in the air. Uh, so what I did was I thought to myself, what is a, what's a stability augmentation system doing? It's literally just probably dithering the elevator. Or, so I just decided to no-nonsensically dither the stick in both pitch and roll and with my feet and yaw. And sure enough, it kept the system from tripping off. I got some strange looks from the guy sitting in the left seat, but it, uh, it was uh, an effective uh, technique of actually keeping the airplane flying. Uh, interestingly enough, we specifically didn't talk to each other, the three pilots in the group, because we didn't want to jade each other's um, techniques of how we were going to tackle this beast. Uh, two guys took the approach of basically waiting for a deviation to happen and then trying to correct it immediately. Uh, that was not as effective in the end as uh, just nonsensically dithering the stick. Uh, and this technique itself was even more uh, resistant to, uh, to gusts, which were obviously a factor out at, uh, at Edwards Air Force Base. Next, please. That just shows we're dealing with about the same rates, even though right. uh, the two techniques were definitely different. Right. So in conclusion, um, we, we basically told Dr. Kulik, said if you want to build this and you want to fly it repeatedly and not hurt yourself or other people, uh, you're going to have to do something with uh, the pitch control of the airplane. Um, the roll SAS was kind of up for grabs between uh, the evaluator pilots. In the end, we basically said that uh, if you're going to fly straight, you don't have to worry about the uh, roll augmentation, and that could save you some time and some effort. Uh, all four configurations were terribly uh, Dutch rolly, uh, and uh, in the snaky sense. Um, anytime you would excite uh, one direction with the stick, you had a bunch of other things going on that you were trying to combat with the other flight controls, and uh, your, your hands and your feet were full, that's for sure. And actually, uh, this is one of the times where we, when we programmed the simulator uh, and we went and flew it, it flew just like the aircraft did up and away, so that was uh, an actual plus, and that gave us some insight into uh, how the airplane was going to fly. He's neglecting to mention that every single pilot crashed the first time they took controls of the right flyer. Yes. Next. So our recommendations 
were to uh, simply use this information uh, to your, to your uh, advantage, and that simply was you need to do something with, uh, with the pitch axis. And uh, they actually, I don't know if Doc Kulik's here, last I spoke with him, um, they're not actually looking at a stability augmentation scheme because they can't drive that uh, canard fast enough. What they're doing is they're changing the actual shape of the wing to mitigate some of the problems with the pitch. Uh, and that's going to allow them to fly the aircraft safely and repeatedly. Uh, crosswinds and gusts, boy, if you can, avoid them because uh, they generally tend to excite some pretty nasty uh, flying characteristics. Uh, you should plan to land in a, uh, take off and land in a wide area. As you saw in the original video, uh, we don't know if there's actually making a turn, but the bottom line is, is that because you excite so many different things when you start putting control inputs in, if the aircraft wants to go a particular way, then you just let it go, level the wings, and set the aircraft back down. And then, uh, obviously, if you can, uh, some ground-based simulation would obviously offer a lot of insight. Matter of fact, after we gave this brief at Test Pilot School, we took Doc Kulik into the simulator, let him fly it, and he crashed a bunch of times, too. So uh, it's a very challenging uh, uh, system to fly. And he's going to be the first pilot that's going to be, gonna be flying the AIAA that's aircraft. That's right. And I think that should be it. You'll just see the video running again while we're looking at questions, and you can see that, uh, yeah, a lot of elevator action in there and a big, huge open field. That this ended up matching our, our recommendations, even though we found this video after our project. All right. Questions? We have time for a couple of questions. Anybody ever fly the airplane yet? The airplane has not flown yet. And this is one of numerous efforts around the country to reconstruct a right flyer. Yeah, AAA has two of them. One of them's on display right now. It's not intended to fly. They have a second one in work, and that's this uh, standoff model that we're talking about. And that's, I mean, they're uh, aiming towards December, obviously. Sure. That's a great question. Uh, what we couldn't simulate were the actual controls that are going to be used in the right flyer, the cradle. Uh, we used a standard set of controls, stick. Throttle was pretty much set. Uh, we didn't touch that because we don't have any thrust effects and a set of rudder pedals. So uh, we, as we assumed right off the bat that we were so far away from reality, we really wanted to just match the rates and, uh, and the general flying quality or handling qualities of the aircraft. So uh, that we, really, that we did not look in depth in that because we knew we were stuck. Yeah, that's why it didn't end up, people have asked why didn't the dithering technique end up in our recommendations. That's because we couldn't extrapolate to that, uh, to the dithering technique actually working on the right flyer due to the different control configuration. We'll take one more. Popular, most unpopular guy in the world because there's going to be thousands of people out to see this thing. At 10.35 in the morning, we're going to have those propellers turning and take off. We have three tracks we're going to put down, and they've given us an 800-foot circle, not exactly where the Wright brothers had flown. And I'm going to have three tracks in general direction where the wind might be, and then at the last moment we can adjust it to what, where the wind is because, frankly, I'm not in favor of even a, a two-degree crosswind in this first attempted takeoff from Kitty Hawk with all those people watching, agony of defeat looking at my face. <laughs> <laughs> Do any of you have any questions for Scott? Questions? Then, Scott, thank you for that. My pleasure. Vern? Uh, I'm a director of the EAA, and uh, I'd like to say on behalf of EAA membership and the basic general aviation uh, community, we want to publicly thank Scott for his engineering excellence, his years and achievements as a test pilot, and also for his leadership in unteaching, remember I said unteaching, modern flying techniques and abilities so that he, his pilots can fly the right flyer uh, safely. Uh, unteaching, I think, is a a major thing that he's well work with. And in addition, we want to say to you, Scott, we really appreciate your dedication and your special effort in the reconstruction, recreation of the Wright Flyer, this most significant airport, airplane. Get to work on your thing. It's just supposed to be. <laughs> <laughs>
All right, Spirit of St. Louis. Vern, Ed, tell us about the Spirit of St. Louis. Why did you do it? Uh, how did it start? And, and uh, how has it gone? Well, first of all, it was built by the EAA up at Oshkosh. Well, at Hales Corner is the first one. And the idea was Dave Jameson, who had one of the original replicas that was used in the movie that Jimmy Stewart uh, uh, starred in, that he went to Paul Poberezny and said, how about building a, a replica of this and fly it around the country to celebrate the 50th anniversary? And that's how it achieved. They built the airplane in 90 days. And uh, it, it really turned out to be a pretty good venue for EAA and for general aviation and, and his, historians. And the airplane is much different from uh, Lindbergh's original airplane, the one that's hanging in the Smithsonian. And the reason it's different is there's no gas tanks in the fuselage because we're not going to go to Paris with it. Lindbergh did that. We don't need it to try to even try that. But so we can have a seat in the front of the airplane and we can have a seat in the back, which we call the Lindbergh seat, and the wicker seat and everything else, like Mrs. Lindbergh's flown with me twice in it, and sit in the back end and uh, achieve that. And I uh, think flights around the country and show people. Now you say, well, Vern, how do you see if you got that cover on? Well, there's a trick to that. We take the panels off of that, and there's four panels that you can come off, and you can see out to the side. You can never see straight ahead with the panels off. And for shows, we can cover it up and fly it like, uh, you know, it would be from the, the rear seat. I, I think one of the significant things of this airplane going around after Mrs. Lindbergh's first flight, and which was up near Hartford, Connecticut, she flew it around the air, well, she wouldn't fly it. I had to fly it. I wanted her to fly because she's a pilot. She was the first woman pilot in the United States. Anyhow, it was really kind of neat to fly around and was flying over, you know, open country and it looked like we were flying in 1927, literally, at, on that particular flight. But when we landed, Mrs. Lindbergh wrote in our logbook something I think is kind of significant in the fact that she had probably talked to her husband as much as any, he talked with anyone else relative to the flight. And she wrote in that book, I now understand a part of my husband's life. It took writing on that wicker seat for even Mrs. L to have a feeling of what uh, uh, her husband may have had a little bit without the weather and without the tiredness and everything else, but it, it was. And this is what we find out most people who fly. Well, in our audience, Ed Schneider, Chuck Yeager's flown it, Neil Armstrong's flown it, and uh, Bob Hoover's flown it, um, and many others. And some very notables like we just mentioned. And then there are people who, young kids, we've had the privilege of taking them for flights to share. What, would you talk about, uh, and Ed too, talk about Lindbergh's flight across the Atlantic and what that airplane was like from an engineering point of view, design, and what he dealt with compared to your redesign of the airplane now? Well, the redesign of the airplane is considerably different in that uh, we don't have the fuel, but he had 480.9 gallons of gas on it. We have 126 on the first one. And so there's, we had the extra seat and everything else. And they built that airplane in 60 days out in San Diego from start to finish. 60 days. And there was little time for doing the test work at all you uh, ladies and gentlemen do. Um, it was basically you take it off and fly it and head for St. Louis and then on to New York. Uh, there wasn't really much time to go test the airplane. I think we probably up at EAA, I was fortunate enough to do a lot of the test flying on the uh, one that uh, EAA built. And Paul Poberesny actually made the first flight. But we went through a complete stall series afterwards and Steve turned with the whole, whole bit and gamut of it. And we, we did find out of an interesting little concept we'll get maybe into a little bit later in with regard, somebody mentioned crosswinds. It's uh, one I'd like to share with you a little bit. If I may, uh, Vern was talking about the testing that was done. According to the logs, it was about four hours and 15 minutes of fl dedicated flight test time before it left San Diego. But the differences between the replica and the original, at least the major ones that, that affect the flying qualities, include um, a tailwheel, spring-loaded but, uh, but not steerable instead of a skid. The ailerons on the replica extend all the way to the tips. Lindbergh's airplane came up short by about eight inches, and the ailerons on the replica are differential. They weren't on the original. 
The, um, the replica uses a uh, Continental 220 horse, seven cylinder radial. The original had a uh, the, uh, whirlwind right engine, which was a nine cylinder 223 horse. Let's see, the replica's got brakes and independent tow brakes on the pedals. The uh, original, of course, did not. What have I forgotten, Vern? No radios. Is it a J5 or a J6? It was a J5C. A J5C on Lindbergh's airplane? Yes. Thank you. There were no brakes, of course, because you didn't need them. And he designed the airplane, and he did the designing along with Donald Hall, but it was his input as the pilot uh, what was going in there. And he designed for one flight from New York to Paris. That was it. They made 174 flights total eventually, but that was the only reason for the design. And as Ed has said, uh, there are things on our replica that we need to have. For instance, we need a tail. Well, we need brakes, you know, to track, uh, taxi out in the concrete and the macadam and everything else. Otherwise, we couldn't, and we, because the airplane has flown mostly on hard surface as opposed to, to the grass, which is really the fun time to fly. What's it like to fly? It's a blast. It's, it's the broomstick. It's unstable all three directions. So you're constantly stirring the pot, and everything you do affects everything else. And uh, I think Vern hit it on the head. It was point designed to cross the Atlantic. So like all airplane designs, this one was a compromise. On the one hand, you said capability to cross the ocean. On the other hand, everything else. The human factors, the, uh, the safety issues, the uh, uh, the tail. Tell them about the tail. Tell them about the tail. The tail. There you go. <laughs> what, the, what, the what I was getting Ed to say was that the uh, airplane is 46 foot wingspan, and they happen to have a tail section, elevators, the whole bit, the vertical stabilizer and horizontal, hanging on a wall for a earlier model Ryan, considerably smaller airplane, huh? And Lindbergh went to Donald Hall and said, could we use that? Because it's already built. All they had to do was cover it. And uh, Donald Hall said, yeah, it uh, might be a little bit unstable and uh, probably be more efficient, plus the fact that they had it there and it saved some time. And it turned out that it was a little bit more efficient. And it certainly uh, turned out to be uh, unstable, which Ed can tell you about too. But if it hadn't been for that instability, we might not be sitting here talking to Lindbergh concerning the type of uh, weather and, and his personal uh, uh, lack of sleep the night before and so on. Lack of sleep, I mean, and uh, combined, it was a good thing he had the instability because that did keep him awake because you do have to fly the airplane. There you've heard it, folks. Longitudinal static instability is a feature. <laughs> <laughs> it reduces trim drag, it keeps you alert, it gets you across the ocean. What? <laughs> Where have you taken this airplane? Where have you flown it? We flew it on a tour in 1977. to some 136 stops, but we made a whole bunch of extra stops. We'd slide into an airport that wasn't... Uh, uh, planned on the tour stops. It was planned where we had an EA chapter. It's been to, I took it to uh, extra trips, went to Canada uh, first year and into Mexico. We crossed over into Mexico just to say we'd been there. And, and of course, in 1987, we, we went to uh, France. I, a quick story about all these extra stops. We, we went to Erie, Pennsylvania. We're coming down from Jamestown to Cleveland. And so we just popped into Cleveland and decided we would... Uh, just surprise the people. And uh, we did. And there was a young man come up to me. He said, how long are you going to be there? And I said, well, we're just going to get a little, buy a few gallons of gas and be on our way down to Cleveland. We have to be down there. So he said, well, are you, could you wait just a little bit? And I said, well, yeah, sure. I didn't know what he was talking about. Man, I went into the men's room and the wall in the men's room and where the telephone must have been very thin because I hear a little coin drop in and dialing of the phone. And remember, what I'm about to tell you is not disrespect. It was his love for his mother. But he puts up the phone. He says, Mom, is that you? And uh, obviously she said, yes. He says, get your tail out here. The spirit of St. Louis is here. I want you to see it. Get your tail out here. Keep talking to your mother. But, <laughs> but she did, and we waited to make sure she saw the airplane. But it was events like that, many events like that, where people wanted to see all ages. I had a man in 
uh, Wheeling, West Virginia. He went up to it and he just started crying. He went up to the airplane and, uh, because he was there when it landed at Moundsville, West Virginia. There's stories that goes on forever of what it's brought to people. And I only thought it was going to be people my age or about. I was totally wrong. There's people from all ages that really relate to Charles Lindbergh. What are you going to continue to do with the airplane? There's no tour as such in place uh, like we did in 77 and 78 uh, that EA had. But what we do do is take it around to different shows, uh, not necessarily air shows per se, but we do go to air shows and we to very special events. Who has questions? Sir. There is a stabilizer trim on the airplane. It's settable in 17 discrete places, and uh, it trims the stabilizer. Exactly. Well, I'm not sure I heard what you said, but I'm going to say yes anyway. <laughs> <laughs> By way of example, the airplane, when, when you set it up at its 1,650 RPM cruise setting, it was indicated when I flew it, 85 miles per hour. If you slow down using just the stick to 70 miles per hour, you have to push on the stick to stay there. If you let go, the nose pitches up at about five degrees per second. And same thing for vice versa. If you go 10 miles per hour faster than trim speed, you've got to pull. And without that pull, it will go through VNE, which was 107 miles per hour on the replica, in under five seconds. So it's You're, Thank confu you. you're confusing speed stability Cross with static winds. stability. Crosswinds, that's me. Pardon? Crosswinds. Crosswinds. <laughs> okay, crosswinds. Cross I think it has an interesting, from a pilot standpoint, it's got a really an interesting concept. When we were first doing the first test work on the airplane at Burlington, Wisconsin, we had a pretty good breeze blow at about 20 to 25 right off the left-hand side. And we uh, got off on another runway and then come back in and landed. And rolling out, it was just above a, what you call a taxi speed, and the left wing starts coming up. And it keeps coming, and the stick is all the way back, and it's all the way in the corner. And it's still coming, and I thought, no, nah, Vern, you don't want to ding this airplane on the first few flights. And I bring it off, off the stop, boom, it popped down. Hmm, that's it, right? So I took off, came back around, exact same thing. Stick back all the way in the corner, bingo. Wing comes up, bing, back it off, she goes straight ahead. So later on during the tour, the uh, same thing happened on the right side uh, or with a right cross wind. It has to be a strong wind, 2025. 20, but we got out to San Diego, and Mr. Ryan was there, T. Claude Ryan, and other people who worked on the airplane, uh, mechanics and uh, later test pilots. And I told them, I said, what had happened? And I said, could you tell me you know, why? Well, Mr. Ryan that evening later on said, you know, he said, we haven't worked together in some 40 years. 40 years. He said, we had a marvelous time back to work. He said, we don't have a clue as to why it does that. <laughs> Questions for Vern or Ed or for Scott, if you've been thinking right flyer. If not, Ed, Vern, thank you. Scott Crossfield, thank you. Gentlemen, see you oh, December somebody, 17th. Question? Yes, sir. No, I, the question you, would, uh, if they'd had uh, the question was if Lindbergh had had a more stable airplane, is there any indication that he might not have made it? Is that your question? Yeah. I think. The, I'm sorry. In other words, he'd have fallen asleep. I have not. I'm not aware of a study. Uh, clearly, they benefited by that uh, that feature that reduced the trim drag. But uh, this was a man obsessed with with drag and with weight, who trimmed his maps and had lightweight boots, and for an airplane. Yes, he did. 85 gallons. Interesting enough, on the oil, um, the tank holds 25 gallons on Lindbergh's airplane. And between San Diego, St. Louis, and New York, they only burned a little bit of uh, oil. So in order to save some weight, he reduced the oil capacity to 20 gallons. And of course, filled it up with gasoline, which I think we'd all do. But I think I would have wanted to put a full tank of oil in it. But 
It worked out because he landed with 85 gallons of gas and 14 and a half gallons of oil. He had more than enough. Questions? Yes, sir. Again? No. Oh. Did he hit the telephone wires? No, the catap catap catapult. The right flyer. Oh, the right okay. flyer. Is the right flyer going to use a catapult? Are you going to slingshot down a track? No, we're trying to do it exactly as the Wright brothers did. No shortcuts, no anything. The catapult they used at Ohio, at, that, at their field in Ohio, on the 1904 and the 1905 model, but not on the 1903 airplane. In fact, the 1903 airplane only flew four times in its entire life, and then it was cannibalized to make the 1904, which wasn't very good, but they catapulted it. And then the 1905 airplane was the first real airplane that maneuvered, and they catapulted it at, uh, I can't remember, something's prairies in Dayton. Huffman Prairie. Yeah, that's right. I keep forgetting it. No, we're not going to catapult it. We're going to hope that that 60-degree 25 knot wind out of uh, off the ocean is going to do it for us. We hope. Scott Crossfield, Vern Job, Zed Colano, thank you, gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you. It's a pleasure. Nice to meet you. Thanks. I'm going to stay up here. Thank you, Vern. It's nice to meet you.